For 75,000 years, a tiny object accompanied humans on their epic journey from hunter-gatherers to the founding of great civilizations. Small spheres, they are simply known as seed beads. Originally made of organic material found in nature's larder, 40 centuries ago, everything changed. The invention of glass allowed them to be mass-produced, placing them in the hands of everyone. This unleashed infinite opportunities for artistic expression. Easily affordable, these dazzling little orbs could be combined in many ways, creating a garment, a necklace, a headdress, a venerated piece of art found in home, temple, and shrine. In some places, they even have the power to turn lives around, bringing hope and prosperity to those in despair. Smaller than other beads in use before the advent of industrialization, they became the tiny, mighty bead that unites the entire world on a string. Tiny, mighty bead. It became one of the most traded items in all the world. Demand for this little titan remains so great today that tons are manufactured around the globe. In Japan, the Toho Bead Company alone produces millions every day in their factory near Hiroshima. Raw material becomes a glass bead through a complex process. With precision and science, ingredients such as silica, soda, and colored dyes are combined, then melted in kilns at temperatures a tenth as hot as the surface of the sun. The resulting molten glass becomes as pliable as toffee candy. As the glass hardens, the supple strand becomes a brittle cane with a hollow center. Yet how that tiny hole is created remains a jealously guarded professional secret. Swift, razor-sharp blades cut the canes into tiny pieces. Washing, cleaning, and polishing come next. Sometimes the glass pieces are dyed again to create a rainbow of colors. Soon, they become familiar objects, tiny orbs of lustrous sheen. In the ancient world, beads were nothing new. But little mass-produced treasures would bring new sparkle to age-old ways. Central and South America, where great civilizations once flourished. Mayans, Incas, and Aztecs crafted beads from shell, coral, jade, turquoise, and stones. Their purpose was not only to grace the body, but to indicate the wearer's rank, status, and wealth. The mountains and valleys of the landscape held many forms of riches, including gold. The ancient people who lived here fashioned objects of breathtaking beauty from it. It was the lure of gold and the prospect of expanding empires that enticed outsiders to these verdant shores.
With the arrival of Columbus in 1492, a new world opened to Europeans. Intrepid adventurers followed, bringing shiploads of glass beads to trade with local inhabitants. And so indigenous materials were rapidly replaced by colorful European glass. The tiny, mighty bead became as prized in the new world as it was in the old. Today, the legacy of the glass bead lives on. In the town of Tepic, nestled on a plateau of west central Mexico, Dionisio Hernandez practices a unique form of beadwork known as Chakira. <laughs> Dionisio is a Wichol Indian, a people directly descended from the ancient Aztecs. Some 18,000 Wichols live in modern-day Mexico. As befitting their noble past, the Wichol are steeped in mysticism. Their spiritual beliefs resonate in all they do, everything they wear, and whatever they create. Many beads come from the faraway Toho factory in Japan and from major bead producing centers in Asia and Europe. While beadwork is a thriving commercial enterprise for these expert craftspeople, for Dionisio Hernandez and his wife Amalia, beads are more than a source of livelihood. They are a personal expression of a deep inner quest for spiritual enlightenment, a quest that permeates all of Wichol society. Shaman Jose Benitez Sanchez sets out from the port of San Blas in Western Mexico to a tiny island. The rocky outcrop is sacred. The Wichol regard it as the navel of the world, a mystical doorway to a pantheon of gods and the realm of the ancestors. To honor Mother Haramara, great goddess of the Pacific, Jose throws an offering into the waters surrounding the island. Then he prays for bountiful crops for rain and for the good fortune of his people. Which old spiritual belief encompasses a connection with the entire planet. Mystical forces bind the earth in all its forms. Everything is revered, animals, rocks, water, even vegetation. The peyote cactus is singled out as a precious gift from the gods. The peyote bears a fruit prized for its hallucinogenic properties. It enables people to raise their consciousness to a higher level. Then, direct communication with the deities becomes possible. Every year, the Wichol undertake a long pilgrimage to a place they call Wirikuta, hundreds of miles from their traditional homes. Here, they fast and worship for 40 days while gathering the peyote that grows in the sanctified soil. As the fruit is eaten, the senses cross the barriers of the physical realm and enter the domain of the gods. Creative energies are fueled by the experience. The role of the peyote is vibrantly reflected in Wichol art. 
people will come from afar to trading stations to choose from a variety of colored glass beads. They search for the perfect palette to best express the hallucinogenic visions that inspired them. Gregoria and Graciela Modina are celebrated artists. They begin with something from the natural world, a skull or an animal figure. A thin layer of beeswax and pine pitch is carefully applied to the surface. One by one, beads are positioned, then pressed into the wax, creating intricate designs. It's a painstaking process. As the wax hardens, the personal vision of the artist becomes a thing of permanent beauty. A final brush of glue ensures the work remains intact. Gourd bowls for everyday use were once decorated in shells, clay, jade, or turquoise. Today, they are embellished by glass beads. Shaman Sanchez places special bowls in a sacred cave as a tribute to the gods. This will entice them to heed his prayers and incantations. The Wichol nurture a special relationship with the animal kingdom. It is a bond that transcends the physical world. Many creatures are sanctified through sculpture, then beaded, for it is believed that people can be empowered with the essence of each animal's spirit and characteristics, including skill, strength, cunning, stealth. Compelled by the encroachment of the modern world, the Wichol have turned to selling beaded artwork to augment their income from subsistence farming. Their creations speak a silent yet powerful language. They are highly prized and sought after by collectors from all over the globe. These colorful creations are manifestations of prayer itself, a means to enshrine spiritual beliefs in physical form, venerated pieces that invoke the gods for health, prosperity, and happiness. At the core of this kaleidoscope of ritual lies the tiny, mighty bead. It forms a vigorous strand that binds one dimension to another and it unites the Wichol with a people far to the north. <laughs> north America, a vast continent inhabited by humans for more than 50,000 years. Most came by way of the Bering Strait spreading into clans that became nations, nations that settled and claimed the land as their own. Living off their environment, they treated all life with profound respect. The essence of their existence was harmony with nature, but that relationship was fractured when settlers from the old world began to invade the new. From far across the Atlantic, Europe gazed at this immense place with covetous eyes. By the 17th century, explorers began arriving in search of opportunity, treasure, and for some, even for religious freedom denied them by church and state in their homelands. 
In England, Queen Elizabeth I sought to exploit the fabled riches of the New World for Britain's young empire. Colonists brought not only ambition, but shiploads of items to trade. Brightest in their cargoes were colorful glass beads, and the indigenous people were dazzled by them. And so, the tiny, mighty bead embedded itself in the everyday world of the Native American, adding a new component to the seeds, shells, stones, copper, and crystals used here for centuries. As more foreigners arrived, they grew into a new nation, competing with the native population for land, bison, and beaver pelts. As settlers crossed the prairies, venturing farther west, the glass bead went with them. Commodities were delivered from one isolated trading station to another by wagon and by horse. In time, an even more powerful horse appeared. One made of iron, powered by steam, and running on rails of steel that crisscrossed the continent. The railroad brought ever more settlers with their dreams their hopes, their virtues, and their vices. And it was not long before towns sprang up. <laughs> Alongside the saloons and the sheriff's office and the houses of ill repute, trading stores opened for business. And so, Next to the six shooters and the bottles of cheap liquor, the ubiquitous glass bead went on sale. From the Arctic tundra to the hot deserts and plains of the south, indigenous people snapped up the little orbs of glass. White settlers brought not only trade, but conquest. Ultimately, Native Americans were vanquished from their land. Forced onto reservations, the dispossessed clung to their cultures. But their creativity never wavered. In fact, the glass bead of the white man inspired their intrinsic talents. Everything was beaded, from baby carriers to moccasins, baskets, clothing, and items of everyday use. The bead was all pervasive, its application limited only by the artist's imagination. <laughs> Oklahoma City, the annual Red Earth Dance Festival. Today, young and old from all Native American nations converge. The Apache, Cheyenne, Cherokee, the Mohawk, Sioux, Blackfoot, the Shawnee, Pawnee, Navajo all come to be judged for their fancy footwork and spectacular regalia, embellished by beads. Dance and dress underpin a celebration of a proud cultural heritage. It's a proclamation of identity and a joyous offering to the great spirit. But there is more. This is an event that allows the original Americans to gather and to offer thanks for their survival. And as always, to honor their ancestors. Clothing and dress are not mere costumed outerwear. They are prayers made manifest. 
These garments symbolically connect the wearer to a higher being. Many of the clothes are family heirlooms, handed down from one generation to the next. Women wear colorful capes imbued with symbols that identify their tribe and also depict their spirit guides. For these people of the plains, prairies, mountains and forests, everything in nature is imbued with spiritual energy even feathers. Eagles are revered for strength, keen eyesight, and hunting skills. So warriors wear eagle calls for protection and as emblems of valor. A sacred creature is the bear. Its power on both the physical and spiritual planes has been recognized since time immemorial. The Red Earth Dance Festival is a testament to the endurance of Native American culture. It's a time to praise the natural world in all its forms a gathering to pay tribute to the past and to acknowledge the great spirit that guides all life. Dance, music, adornment, and spiritual elements are all intertwined through the tiny, mighty bead. A precious object found everywhere, even on the other side of the globe. Nepal, a small kingdom high in the Himalayas, at the crossroads of India and China. Here, on the rooftop of the world, a melting pot of cultures thrives, including the Newar people who settled here in the third century. Hinduism is their major religion. Nepal's capital city, Kathmandu. It is October, and preparations are underway for one of the most important events of the year, the festival of Tihar. Tihar is unique to the Newar. It will last five days, and is intended to express reverence and respect for all life, especially domestic animals. But Tihar has another purpose, to celebrate light, the outer manifestation of inner spiritual illumination. Tihar is an exciting time an opportunity to rejoice by wearing the finest of clothes. Beads feature prominently in the proceedings. Prior to the festival, the center of attraction is the bead market. Newar women throng here to have new necklaces made. 
Tihar is an occasion to wear the very best examples of something exclusive to this part of the world. The most important Nepalese jewelry item, which is the wedding necklace, it's called Tilari. Tilari consists of seven gold beads and red seed beads. The home of Jyoti and Sagun Sharma. Tihar is celebrated by the entire family. For Sagun, it is a time to wear several of her prized tilleries. The beads are very important in the life of a Nepalese woman. They are used in, uh, during several occasions. So with the different designs for different occasions, different times, they always wear them. And it's best wear on a sari, a blouse. And red is a very auspicious color for women. It shows that the women are married and uh, they have to have a beautiful conjugal life. In this home movie footage shot in 1984, Jyoti concludes his marriage to Sagun by presenting her with a red tillery. The necklace symbolizes the groom's prayers for the happiness and fertility of his bride. Sagun will wear her tillery of red and gold as a token of respect for her husband and for the blessing of motherhood. The wedding necklace, like our wedding ring, is worn every day. Now, a woman may have different ones with different colors for different uh, saris to match the color, but uh, then if she's wealthy, she may have other ones. Or she may also have some other necklaces with different arrangements. These seven beads may be arranged in a different way, always combined with seed beads. And there's some very elaborate ones now. They're actually worn across the chest and then the tillery rests on the hip bone. When the husband dies, because these seed beads signify the life force of the husband, the beads are either discarded or they go on the funeral pyre with the husband and are burned with the husband's body. In Kathmandu, the glass bead business is thriving. Ten, ten, ten. Really? Yes. The same color. Same thing. color, different color. This, this one. This one. Okay. This one. Many, so many. So many. I will. No. When trade with the outside world blossomed in the 1980s, beads of new colors and designs were imported in large quantities. Nowadays, the tillery can be created from hues previously unavailable. Even black and white, once associated with death and mourning, are being embraced as a bold fashion statement. In these regions, creativity takes many forms, especially across the western border of Nepal. Here lies a sprawling and exotic land. Rudyard Kipling's legendary realm of gold, India. In the northern areas of Rajasthan and Gujarat, tranquil lakes shimmer beyond wind-blown deserts. This is where Maharajas built majestic palaces and lived in exotic splendor. In Udaipur, grand structures and mirrored rooms reflect a once fabled past. It was an extravagant and indulgent era, one of untold wealth. In a palace in Gondal, relics of the hunt recall the days of the Raj, when British rule extended from the Khyber Pass to the Bay of Bengal. Echoes of empire resonate in exquisite objects made of gold and silver. Ornate containers once carried messages and gifts to the Maharaja. Displayed everywhere is an array of beadwork, each piece unique and priceless. Bead 
beads were not new to India. Glass beads had been made here for thousands of years, but their colors were limited. During the 19th century, as Muslim traders from India followed the flags of Britain's empire into Africa, they were surprised to encounter tribes sporting multiple colored glass seed beads from Europe, a result of growing trade between European bead makers and the so-called dark continent. The dazzling colors surpassed anything made in India. So, the little European seed bead found a new market. Soon they were flooding into India through the port of Bombay. The women of North India were always skilled in the art of embroidery. The arrival of small European glass beads lent a new dimension to their craft. Items of daily use were now enriched by brilliant new colors as seed beads were stitched into every facet of life. In Gondal today, the same beadwork tradition lives on. In the scorching deserts of western Gujarat, rainfall is scarce and life is harsh. Many of the Rabari people are nomadic. Originally from Afghanistan, they traverse these dusty terrains in search of food and water as their forefathers did for over a thousand years. Dressed in traditional embroidered clothes with necklaces, bracelets and beaded ornaments, they seasonally trek for pastures anew. Loaded down with everything their owners possess, utensils, furniture and even small animals, the loyal camel is key to the Rabari's survival. To honor them, the people adorn their camels with beads. Not all Rabari are nomads. In this settlement, vibrant shades add depth and texture to an otherwise austere existence. This is especially obvious in homes called bungas. Within, they hold treasures that dazzle the eye. The Rabari's richly embroidered clothes are among the finest in the world. Beadwork is everywhere. Rabari women have been sewing and beading as far back as anyone can remember. Through arranged marriages, girls are sometimes wed when they are eight years old. But women in Rabari society are highly respected. In the village of Hari, preparations are underway for a wedding. Major rites of passage like births, marriages and deaths trigger a flurry of communal activity, much of it in the form of embroidery. Stitching and beading reflect the excitement of the upcoming event. And everything must be perfect as a dowry for the young bride. Purses and bags are smothered in beads, as well as tiny mirrors to reflect evil spirits. <laughs> The wedding dress is the most stunning beaded item of all.
there is something for the groom too, a beaded veil. As in many worldwide cultures, the face must not be seen until the marriage ceremony is over. It is customary to protect the young couple from the feared evil eye and from jealous glances. Nowadays, many Rabari groups work for the benefit of local communities. Preschool children are taught to count using an abacus, one of the earliest practical uses for beads. Through a grassroots trust fund called Kalaraksha, the aim is to resurrect vanishing traditional arts. Marketing of the products will inject new cultural and commercial vitality into the region. Thus, the tiny, mighty bead brings promise and prosperity to this remote part of the world. But the little bead's relevance is just as potent elsewhere. East of India, far beyond the Ganges, is a place where golden domes and soaring spires reach for the sky. This is Myanmar, the land once known as Burma. Though long isolated from the outside world by communist rule, within its borders, religion and culture thrive. Buddhism, which took root here in the 13th century, proclaims itself through a patchwork of temples and pagodas that cover the landscape. The people embrace a lifestyle where little has changed over the eons. Art reflects the very fiber of the people's being, fueling traditional practices that date back to the time of Gautama Buddha himself. The land radiates with Buddhism, perhaps more so than anywhere else on earth. Local art takes its roots in ancient times. In these meticulously crafted works, religious mandalas used for meditation slowly emerged from the warp and weft of the cloth. The pieces are colloquially known as kalagas, in times gone by, they were studded with precious jewels and gold, gracing the walls of monasteries, temples and palaces. With incredible dexterity, beautiful new kalagas take form under the keen eye and nimble fingers of these young people. The embroideries speak of the life of the Buddha and tell epic myths such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata the longest poem ever written. Today, modern kalagas are created in family workshops in the city of Mandalay. What was once the exclusive preserve of royalty and the priesthood is now produced for a burgeoning tourist trade as Myanmar slowly throws open its portals to visitors from the outside world. Gold thread and colored yarns have taken the place of the solid gold objects once sewn into the cloth. Jewels have been replaced by sequins, alongside the ubiquitous tiny, mighty glass seed bead. Kalaga techniques were pressed into service for another colorful tradition for which Myanmar is world-renowned. Glass beads are appliqued to the costumes of stringed marionettes. Every puppet is a handmade, one-of-a-kind example of an ancient art form.
For hundreds of years, puppetry amused kings and queens in palatial parlors, workers in the marketplace, and even worshippers in the courtyards of pagodas and temples. Religion, history, legends and mythology all come to life under the swift handwork of the puppeteers. These master showmen of Myanmar know no peers. Theirs is an art form that stimulates the senses while telling stories rich in tragedy and comedy. As they dance, just, tumble and spin through ancient tales of courage, enduring love stories, great battles or comic melodrama, the puppets come to life through more than the manipulation of strings. They mesmerize the audience through the power of their antics and the sparkle of their adornments, crafted from cloth and the tiny mighty bead. from the palaces of Mandalay, tucked high in the rugged hills of northwestern Myanmar, lies a place unlike any other. Isolated by geographic barriers and warlike tribes for centuries, it is known as Nagaland. Flanking the northeastern border of India, it remains one of the most inaccessible regions on Earth. Stemming from many backgrounds, the 16 major tribes who live here are collectively known as the Naga. Surviving in isolation as their ancestors did, they settled the soaring mountains and deep valleys, living entirely off the land. In recent years, Nagaland opened a narrow crack to the outside world for a rare glimpse into the cultural legacy of these fascinating people. In the village of Leshi, perched high in the hills, thousands of men and women gather to celebrate the new year, a three-day event marking a time to reinforce friendships and to share experiences of the previous year. <laughs> Many have come here on foot, taking days to cross treacherous jungles and forests. The songs and dances connect the people to their ancestors and their gods. Deities are invoked for the blessings of good health, an equable climate, and bountiful crops for the coming year. Beads are bountiful. Not long ago, a celebration like this would have been impossible. There was a time when terror reigned this land. For many of the Nagas were once headhunters. It was an era when the most prized trophies of battle were the severed heads of their enemies. Headhunting was seen as the very measure of a man. By subduing an enemy and severing his head, the warrior was able to gain the soul, wisdom and stature of his adversary. A human head was usually brought back to the village where it was broken into small pieces and then divided among the people. Headhunting served a grisly but vital role in early Naga society. It was believed that it brought the gift of fertility upon the tribe. Preservation 
of the population took precedence above all else, and fertility meant survival. The head was kept as a symbol of the prowess and of the strength of the village and of the warriors in the village. It was actually symbolized on things worn by the warriors, such as brass trophy heads or wooden trophy heads that the warriors might have worn, or by monkey skulls, as opposed to wearing the real head or a part of the real head, which was not done. Outlawed by the British at the height of its empirical control, headhunting is now a thing of the past. But legacies of ancient Naga rituals live on in their adornment, for they believe that what they wear is who they are. The dress of the warrior alludes to brave deeds and victorious battles. Apart from human heads, the skull and teeth of the tiger was especially valued. Hunting the mightiest of all jungle creatures earned the man the same high esteem as the taking of a human head. Tiger's teeth are strung on necklaces, proudly worn to display the warrior's valor. As tiger populations dwindle to the precipice of extinction, their teeth are now replicated from the carved bones of domestic animals. Other animal parts are valued. Boar's tusks, fur, claws, horns. By wearing them, the Naga believe they take on the very essence of the animal spirit. Goat or dog's hair dyed red once indicated that the warrior had set fire to his enemy's village. Alongside seed beads, cowrie shells are also included in the regalia. Of all the people who inhabit these hills, members of the Tungul tribe wear the most extravagant headdresses of all. Feathers of the Indian hornbill are rare and therefore highly valued. Red and white seeds from a tall, wild growing grass that is a staple food in these parts is a primary form of adornment. And beneath it, the tiny, mighty glass seed bead glistens. In this male-dominated culture, women are not allowed to own property, so beads are their only form of personal wealth. Tungul women wear identical necklaces to those of men, serving as a proclamation of their tribal identity. It will be treasured throughout their lives and passed down as a family heirloom. When Nagaland was opened to the West, some of the finest necklaces were traded with early explorers. Many have been preserved in private collections and museums worldwide. These are glass beaded necklaces, mostly worn by a cognac woman, show the status of the wearer to be quite high, as they all are made of materials which were difficult to obtain and costly. This collar has turquoise beads, usually means highborn or chief clan when you're talking about it in terms of the cognac tribe. And anybody who would see her would know that she is part of a chief's family, a wealthy man's family, a warrior's family, someone who had attained the privilege of wearing these or who had amassed the wealth and the status to accumulate the materials that go into making these particular pieces. Though the Naga live in a landlocked area hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, jewelry cut from the marine chank shell is especially valued. Brought here from the shores of India, it is flaunted alongside the tiny glass bead. In times gone by, marine chank shells were a form of currency. They were so valuable that just a few would buy a goat or a cow, throw in a few more, and it was enough to buy the life of a human slave. B 
Beads are indispensable for the Naga and their distinctive culture. Beads are the first item given to newborn babies, a ritual to welcome them into the world and into the tribe. Beads will remain with an individual for life, from the cradle to the grave. Considered part of a person's very being, beads are buried with the dead. Beads assure the wearer of a place in the afterlife. For in these hills, even unto eternity, everyone is linked through the tiny mighty bead. In many areas of this far corner of the world, other tribes share a common legacy with the Naga through the little orbs of glittering glass. Southeast Asia. A huge swath of tropical forests and rice paddies between the Andaman and South China Seas, incorporating Vietnam, Thailand and Laos. <laughs> Relying on a predominantly agricultural lifestyle, the people live in tiny villages, one more inaccessible than the other. Age-old traditions thrive, with the bead very much a part of everyday affairs. Villages perched high in the mountains of northwestern Vietnam are home to what are known as the Yao people. They make up many groups, sharing a common genesis with those from a giant neighbor to the north, China. Yao communities distinguish one another through names that refer to adornment or garment colors. Hence, they are the Red Yao, or Black Yao. A very distinctive dress code includes the tiny mighty bead. A woman's headdress can encompass 24 layers of red cloth wound into a turban. A girl is presented with a single cloth on reaching puberty. After marriage, she will acquire additional layers. Embroidery is integral to every Yao woman's life. Designs reflect religious beliefs, all based on a Taoist creed of maintaining balance and harmony with the wild environment. People in this village express their identity through headdresses adorned with an abundance of tassels. They're embellished with silver, coins, and the ever important seed bead. In the highest altitudes of the mountains of Laos, far from any semblance of the modern world, live the people known as the Black Mong. New Year is an especially happy time. For women, it's an opportunity to display personal wealth. A vibrant legacy of song enhances the enduring spirit of these little known yet friendly people. It is Saturday in Can Cao, Vietnam, and that means market time. Produce brought here will supply food for the coming week. Because of their colorful attire, 
These people are known as the flower monk. To complement their clothes, matching beads are strung into fringes, lending a special flair to the garment. The people travel for miles, often through the most difficult terrain. But it is important they attend this weekly event, for essential commodities are hard to come by. Despite two opium wars with Europe during the 19th century and modern-day condemnation of the industry, opium is a popular narcotic. It's been enjoyed here for as long as people can remember. Beaded baby carriers are happily shown off by mothers, for each one is individually crafted by her for her child. In northern Thailand, rites and rituals are an integral part of life. The Akka hill tribe people perform a dance to awaken the ancestors and to summon spirits for a blessing upon their descendants. In Akka culture, each person is a link to a great chain of birth, death and rebirth cementing an unbroken continuum from past to future. The Akka appeal to their ancestors for guidance in everyday matters. They rely on ancestral support for maintaining fields, crops, animals, and even to heal during times of sickness and want. With no written history, the preservation of Akka heritage is passed down verbally from one generation to another. A person should be able to recite the names of all his or her ancestors, calling upon them in time of need. Special attire is a token of respect for those who came before them. Among the strands of tiny glass beads, silver is especially prized. It is a common commodity that is tantamount to the family bank account in Western society. Everything from rings to coins are integral to the Akka hat. Silver and other valuables often attract suitors and are the catalyst behind many marriages. For some Akka, life is tough. Many barely eke out a living from traditional crafts so they turn to other ways of sustaining themselves. Poppies are grown in vast quantities for opium production and serves as one of the area's most bountiful sources of income. Women open the pods and prepare the seeds for producing this much sought after and lucrative narcotic. In the hills of northern Thailand dwells a rare and remarkable people. They are the Paduang Karn, who migrated here from their native Myanmar. Often simply referred to as the long-necked Karn, they wear multiple brass rings around necks, arms and legs. A strange tradition that began in ancient times. Rings are snapped around young girls' necks at the age of six. More rings are added during ensuing years. Most women limit themselves to 20, but some sport over 30 rings. Their bones have become accustomed to these metallic exoskeletons. Remove the rings and the woman will die, as the vertebra in her neck have long ceased to be able to support the weight of her head. 
the Karen nurture this odd ritual. An extra long neck is regarded as something beautiful and a sure way of attracting a husband. As with all hill peoples living in rural Southeast Asia, adornment plays a crucial role. At its center lies a conspicuous and much beloved object, the tiny mighty bead. A world away in the Southern Hemisphere, the revered little object has been embraced by a very different culture. South Africa, a land of extraordinary riches, of breathtaking landscapes, exotic wildlife, and fabulous natural treasures, like gold and diamonds. But its greatest treasure is its people. At its heart, South Africa is a vast patchwork of tribes. One of the best known, of the Zulu. Every year, near the country's northeastern coast, thousands of young Zulu maidens play a role in an age-old tradition the royal reed ceremony. Many have journeyed hundreds of miles for the honor of participating in an ancient rite of passage. In ages past, what is now known as the reed ceremony was a celebration of fertility, a time when pubescent girls were encouraged to take husbands, bear children, and propagate the tribe. Now, as in times gone by, they celebrate their youth and moral standing, donning themselves in nothing but beads. Throughout the centuries, glass beads have played a pivotal role in African tribal life. Zulu women create some of the finest beadwork in this enormous and mysterious continent, long recognized as the cradle of humanity. Much of the work and evidence on this auspicious day reflects age-old patterns, timeless in their simplicity. Others are bold expressions of each girl's individuality. The young girls carry reeds cut from estuaries. They are taken to awaiting tribal elders and to royalty. Guest of honor is their revered king, Gudwo Zuelatini Ka Bekuzulu. Eighth direct descendant of the mighty Shaka, who unified disparate tribes into a powerful African empire during the 19th century, the king's subjects wait with eager anticipation for the arrival of the procession. At its height, the kingdom of the Zulus was much feared and respected. It conquered tribes deep in the African hinterland and fought off invading Dutch and British colonists. For years, the traditions of the people were suppressed, first under colonial rule and later under the doctrines of apartheid, which rigidly divided not only the country's many races, but one tribe from another. Today's reed ceremony is a resurrection of the Zulu nation's heritage, bursting forth from a proud and powerful past. Colorful beads proclaim the identity of the community, thriving anew since apartheid fell in the early 1990s. The reed is a symbol of what traditional folklore holds to be the mystical ancestor of the Zulus. It is said that he emerged from a bed of reeds in ancient times, fathering the ancestors of the nation. It is believed that if a girl taking part in the ceremony is not a virgin, her reed will break, embarrassing her in front of the gathering. 
Thousands of young voices proclaim the girls' virtues and virginity as they prepare to take their place in adult society. Stacks of towering reeds will be used to build temporary symbolic structures at one of the king's many palaces, augmenting the people's bond with the spirits of their ancestors. In an ever-changing world, today's ceremony differs in one major respect to those of the past. Instead of merely praising fertility, it is used as a platform to remind the young girls of the danger of AIDS a disease that is ravaging the people of Africa. Like so many tribes, the Zulus have suffered terrible losses from the pandemic. In South Africa alone, over a thousand people die of AIDS every day. <laughs> King Zuelatini cautions his subjects, imploring them to avoid contracting the deadly HIV virus. The king has six wives. Beads play a crucial role in their lives. Queen Bushle was his second bride. They wed in the early 1970s. When I married the king, then I had to put the beads because it, it, it is a tradition. To, to put on the, the, the beads because you no know, king wife or a king king's wife should put on some beads. On on special occasion or big occasions then I will wear this. I feel good if I wait. <laughs> Queen Bushle's daughter, Princess Nandi, also values the importance of beads in Zulu culture. I love beads. Love beads. One most important thing I like about the beats is the sound. They make a certain sound even when you dance. They give you a certain beat. When I'm wearing beads, it shows that I'm an African, I'm in Africa, and I can wear them with anything with my modern clothes, with my traditional clothing. I love wearing beads. If I don't wear beads, I don't think I'll consider myself as an African. <laughs> Though Princess Nandi is a Zulu, she is married to a man from what was once a rival nation. Prince Bovolenga Mfundu Mitirara is a Tembu, one of the many Kosa-speaking peoples who inhabit the southeastern part of the country. I got my first beads from my husband when he was asking for my hand in marriage. This historic footage was shot during Princess Nandi's and Prince Bobolenge's wedding in 2002. Political differences have defined tribal relations throughout Africa for centuries. Not very long ago, Zulus and Tembus were engaged in violent conflict with one another. Faction fighting between them has significantly diminished, but subtle animosities still linger. The wedding was intended to bridge any remaining differences. Nelson Mandela, internationally respected icon of the new South Africa, is a member of the Tembu royal lineage. His presence at the marriage endorsed the unification of the two tribes. The purpose of the marriage, it was to bring the two cultures together, the Zulu culture and the Tim culture. I have a very mm -hmm. significant uh, role to play. I have to revive the spirit of peace and love within, between the two nations. The royal intertribal marriage was a high-profile expression of the settling of old conflicts and of the spirit of optimism that defines post-apartheid South Africa. This is a country that has an ageless association with beads. 
Beads once served multiple purposes in Zulu society, even as an inventive form of language. Less than a generation ago, young men and women who were courting used a system of codes, colors, and patterns to express their feelings for one another. Before we learn how to read and write, they lose the beads to write the letters. The white color here meaning a love. But now the blue one, the lady she meant to say, she can fly to the skies looking for someone. And the red one, she meant to say her heart is bleeding for someone. If the love was over, it would be a black bead in the middle here. Love letter, to have uh, something written with their minds that if I put white beads much, I mean a lot of love. If I put red, it means that I always had a heart, so if I put green, I was waiting for you until I was thin as a grass of blade. During the British colonial period in the late 19th century, South Africa became flooded with tiny glass seed beads from Europe. Much of the influx was due to missionaries who often used beads to lure potential converts to Christianity. Beads spread everywhere and were quickly absorbed into traditional tribal life. Soon, tens of thousands of imported colorful glass seed beads were woven into a multitude of objects. An explosion of creativity erupted. Modern-day Zulu rickshaws in the city of Durban are renowned for their innovative way of displaying beads, even holding annual competitions to honor the most flamboyantly dressed. In the central region of South Africa, another tribe uses color in an especially distinctive way. They are the Indibele, who make their home just north of the country's capital city, Chwane, formerly known as Pretoria. The Indibele's unique style has become internationally known. Vibrant hues and abstract shapes create a colorful geometric oasis in a dry and dusty landscape. Beads and other bodily adornments are boldly combined. Esther Mashlangu, a world-famous mural artist, was the first Ndebele woman to travel abroad to publicize her culture. When she returned to Africa, she opened an art school at her home near Mapoko. Here, she shares her knowledge and creative skills with others. Although these patterns are impressive when expressed in pigments on walls, they are even more colorfully rich when crafted into elaborate beadwork. In Indibeli society, beaded garments indicate the various phases of a woman's life. A married woman wears a textile blanket adorned with beaded strips, one for each year of marriage. Also popular are beaded back skirts and rectangular shaped front aprons.
Older beadwork will sometimes be recycled and incorporated into a new item of clothing or artwork. Passed down from one generation to the next, beads in a family are often over a hundred years old. And the Bailey women are some of the most innovative bead workers on the continent. Creating instinctually, they never consult a pattern or a drawing. In rural areas where poverty is often rife, women gather to collectively send their creations to urban areas where they are sold to sustain their communities. Especially popular with collectors and galleries abroad are fertility dolls made by various tribes throughout Southern Africa. A fertility doll has a very practical function. It is often presented to a young bride, embodying within it the blessings for a happy marriage and the promise of abundant children. An American man who came here and he bought a few fertility dolls, he took them back to America and he's never stopped thanking me because all his daughters-in-law felt pregnant. The National Gallery, Cape Town. Here, traditional South African beadwork is being carefully preserved. Carol Kaufman is curator of the beadwork collection. She has been instrumental in helping the gallery acquire some of its most valued artifacts. This is a fly whisk, which is a traditional symbol of an African leader. And it's quite ubiquitous all over Africa. It's made of beads, incorporating Venetian trade beads, as well as lucky beans, which are organic. And at the bottom we have an animal tail as the whisk part, because cattle are very sacred in Southern Africa. This we put in prison Mandela's office when he was in power, and he loved this piece. For him, it really symbolized true leadership. And then when he packed up to leave office, he had neatly put it with his belongings to take it with him. And unfortunately, we had to claim it back because it's part of our national heritage. But President Mandela loves beadwork. Johannesburg, typical of the metropolitan South African city, where traditional beadwork has now found its place in the modern world of high fashion. Today, tiny orbs of glass beads proudly appear alongside expensive diamonds and emeralds, such as this necklace valued at well over a quarter of a million dollars. Everywhere, there is a revival of traditional bead craft. The work is sold in galleries, street markets and bustling sidewalks. As the most advanced, yet still developing country on the continent, 
South Africa is home to major charitable movements aimed at assisting the underprivileged. Barbara Jackson founded an outreach program in Cape Town that has been creating new opportunities for impoverished women. And it all rests on tapping into the power of none other than the tiny, mighty bead. The work done here offers prospects for the betterment of society. A society that for a long time was ravaged by poverty, political turmoil, and now AIDS. The group is responsible for creating thousands of pieces of original artwork each year. Everyone an expression of its creator's thoughts, pain, dreams and hopes. The wonderful thing about the project is that the people all work at home. We have a lot of handicapped people. We work with ladies who are deaf and dumb. We work with ladies who have severely handicapped children who can't leave home. So the wonderful thing is that people can make a living. In their own way, these tiny sparkling objects have the ability to turn lives around. We like to, to use the word happy dolls because the ladies who make the dolls, they really love working and doing what they're doing and I think it brings happiness to everyone. Far from the cities and freeways in the heart of Zulu country, beads have taken on yet another role. The Zulus have always been admired for their exquisite basketry and weaving. Now, the tiny, mighty bead has found its way into even this celebrated ancient craft. But the result is something very new. Using copper wire instead of traditional grass, artists create pieces that are unparalleled. Everyday objects like discarded empty bottles, pots, and even eggs are pressed into service as a form of inner mold. Tiny glass beads on strands of wire are intricately woven around them. The results are stunning. Bracelets, baskets, and other decorative objects will make their way from this rural area to art collectors around the world. In turn, the lives of the object's creators will be enriched through the earning of much needed local currency and foreign exchange. East of Johannesburg is a settlement where the ugly scars of apartheid are still evident. Shattered communities have yet to overcome poverty and squalor. And now, a new scourge. Almost a third of the people here are infected with HIV. For many, the outlook is grim. But for those who seek it, a beacon of hope lies just down the road. The local Dominican church has set up a workshop where these courageous women can stitch their lives back together again. Part of the um, impact of HIV and AIDS, which exacerbates the situation, is the poverty. So in order to restore the people from a very hopeless situation, we began the income generating project, which is the Kopenang project. Kopenang means gathering together. Women from historically displaced communities, many of them were forcibly removed to these areas in the 70s and 80s. So to deal with the cultural differences, we do it in a creative way. We share stories, we share what we call the legacy of their lives. The common um, thread is suffering and the common outcome is hope and gives them something creative which is healing in itself. And not only that, it provides and a means of income to feed their children. So it's a very holistic approach. And we have 35 little ones that come every day, Monday to Friday, and they're all impacted by HIV AIDS. So many of them are positive, but not all of them. Some of them are left orphaned by, but not necessarily HIV positive themselves. So they're from the age of six months to um, six years. This is a, a place of great hope and joy. You're going to put your needle in the top of 
bead number four. Through three, through two, through one, and out. Fabulous. Has everybody got Here, loop? hope and self-esteem can slowly be restored through the art of beadwork. The women learn basic business skills while producing work that will be sold to generate a regular income for themselves and for their families. We are Sasa. We are Pezulu. We are Pezulu. We are The bottom. The bottom four of the second row. While we teach broad business skills, we actually then will apply them specifically to the beading skills that we are teaching in the afternoon. And in that way, we are endeavouring to enable these women to understand the basics of business and also to have the skills to produce saleable products. Well done. Nice pattern, nice colours. All the women in the class are either infected or affected by HIV AIDS. Self-esteem is at an all-time low. Low self-esteem is absolutely not going to produce beautiful product, nor is it going to produce sustainable business. So what we're working with all the time is to try and build courage and faith in these women, faith in themselves and belief in what they do. Because in that way, I believe their businesses have the potential to become sustainable. Your biggest challenge is going to be the voice in your head that tells you you cannot. Don't let that voice grow strong. You need to shift from fear to love. love. Okay? Very nice. Thank you. Oh, look here, we've got another one here. Wow. Ooh, nice. Ooh, nice. Wow. Yay, yeah, nice. Wow. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. If an individual is excelling, the rest of the group celebrate that success. And that, for me, is already a great step ahead for them in this learning environment. Pain is often a, a point of sharing. Um, and their singing is a sign of hope as well. When the pain is too much, the tears come, and somebody in the group will start humming. Gradually, the whole group will sing. And there comes a moment, it never ever fails, when as they're singing, there's a sense that this pain is held, um, held communally, and held by a power that's greater than ourselves, um, however we would wish to name that power. And that, for me, is, is a real indication of the way they trust one another, the fact that, that they're able to share such extremes of pain with one another and feel themselves to be supported. Just the challenge of delivering on what we've promised and what we believe is possible at times is actually really overwhelming. But coming in and just touching the spirit of these women and looking at what they achieve with the little and the small resources they have, for me, is just the most extraordinary, humbling and exciting. I get quite tearful. It just is incredibly exhilarating and really motivating. And it's a great privilege to work with them. Um, very special people. Never give up. A phrase that enshrines these women's faith and hope in a world where poverty and disease can easily overcome the strongest human spirit. But not here, for the tiny, mighty bead has emboldened these creative and courageous people to believe and to survive. In rural areas, villages are scattered throughout the countryside. Vast distances can easily impose isolation between people. But each morning, these Zulu women walk for hours, headed for a special place. Nothing deters them. Some wade across the Tugela River to reach their destination.
When they all meet up, the gathering finds solace at a place called Masinga, doing what many do in such places around the world, exchanging news, enjoying one another's company, and working in a spirit of cooperation. Bedecked in their distinctive style of dress, the women engage in beadwork. The products of their labors will be sold to bring in funds that will serve the interests of their families and the community at large. Many have lost their husbands to AIDS. Others have spouses who work in faraway cities, in the gold mines or in industry. The women have no option but to become self-dependent. And their greatest asset is their creative skill. Other than the cultivation of cash crops around their villages, beading is their sole source of revenue. Moving to the cities to join their husbands is not an option. As the South African economy grows, housing is in critically short supply. Here, they can practice their craft in what must surely be one of the loveliest landscapes in all of sub-Saharan Africa. The surrounding countryside resonates to the optimism of these gentle yet resilient people. Celebrating the blessings of life and the joys of the creative process. Thus, the noble little orb made of glass finds a new purpose in a timeless place, a continent steeped in mystery and warmed by the heart of its people. They are not alone. They are bound with others like them on every point of the compass, for they all have one thing in common, the tiny, mighty bead that unites the entire world on a string. <laughs>